our best life. Please welcome Rosalind Kahn. Hi, this is Rosalind Kahn from the Rosalind Kahn Show. Today, I'm going to take a trip back memory lane. We didn't get to where we are without people who help us get there. This guy was a great mentor in my life many years ago when I just decided to give him a call. So this is my good friend, Bill Sterl, who's world famous, renowned. I know he helps people get focused in their life and help them get to where they want to go. So, Bill, take us back to that car ride in the introduction to the dog. Right. So um, the way people know me out in the world is Bill Sterly, just to let you know that there's a pronunciation thing going on there, as well as where you and I started is, you know, something back in the past. Uh, we went to some workshops together and we did some different kinds of things. And the way I, I mean, if you think, I'm trying to think about how long ago with this, it's got to be kind of around, you know, 10, 15 years almost, it seems to me. And we've had times that we've connected different ways, but the way I support people and the way I contribute to people is I'm really in, the, I'm a communication expert that helps people understand communication from three different points of view. And I do various different trainings and executive coaching for those three different points of view. And communication is kind of divided into these three areas. Okay. So, um, and you can ask as many questions as you want. And it's about these three things because they're all like totally fascinating. Cool. So the, the first one has to do with a thing called thinking communication. Different people think differently. And because they think differently, they use different vocabulary. And because they use different vocabulary, they come from different communication points of view. Let me give you four of them and, and we'll kind of have some fun with it. So well, if I had the job as an engineer, my vocabulary might be focused around, let's say, logic, rational thinking. It would be focused around mathematics, maybe analytics. I'd be pretty good at putting things together because I'm an engineer type person. So I would know how things work, but that would be very, very different than the vocabulary that a social worker speaks from. So a social worker is going to help people and they're going to have more access to interpersonal communication. They're going to have better connections with individual because they're going to be able to speak to emotions and the ups and downs of people's lives and life's circumstances, situation. So an engineer might be here, but a social worker is speaking this way and they're not quite reaching each other because I've got an interpersonal thinker, right. which is very different than a rational thinker. Okay. So that's two different types of thinking styles. The other two is let's say an entrepreneur, somebody that's very creative, like an artist, somebody that is like a marketing person that has ideas, that's more conceptual, more person that has multiple ideas, that has their finger in a lot of pies. And you kind of do this entrepreneurial kind of thinking just to let you know that that's what you do as if this is not a surprise, which is very opposite than an administrator, somebody that follows the rules like a police officer or somebody that does things in sequence like an operations manager. Ent entrepreneurs are different than operations managers. So these four different kinds of thinking is called preference thinking and preference thinking leads to preference communication. Now, one third, I'm going to say it out loud, one third of conflict lives in this space. One third of conflict. So if I want to reduce conflict by one third, probably be a good idea to understand what these four different vocabularies are. And if somebody wants to, like the operations person wants to speak in a step-by-step -step unfolding of the topic, it's very different than an entrepreneur or an artist that thinks in overview and a conceptual framework and does idea chunks and speaks in that way. Cause that's not the same as step-by-step -step. that's like following directions and stuff that other person's not following directions. Whereas if the engineer, a communication pattern might be brief, clear, 
precise information that's fact-oriented, that has to do with, here's what I can measure, here's what's quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Where a social worker or a teacher or a nurse is going like, you know what? I just want to make sure people are connected here. I want to make sure there's a lot of collaboration and cooperation that take place. I want to make sure there's n- that we have everybody's voice included inside the discussion, because otherwise you've got one person that has the fact and the other person has the people skills and neither of them are going to fully get there. <laughs> They've right. got to be able to have all of those four things that take place. Now in business, the way this uh, works, Rosalind, is, is that, which is really delightful is, is that I can have a CFO that's that mathematical person, which is very different than my vice president of human resources, which is like the social worker. Notice that that's two different executive positions that are very opposite of each other. And then meanwhile, My marketing person that's like my entrepreneur person is very different than my COO, my chief operational officer, which is going to implement things. This person contacts a whole bunch of people. This person has to implement and mail out the product in order to deliver the product with the right address and make sure the invoice is paid. Those are four different very, very different executives. Now the CEO is the person that sits in the middle and balances those other four experts or those other four ex- expertise in there that's mm-hmm. sitting there. Right, right next to the HR director is the VP of sales. Right next to the uh, CFO is the person in char- charge of information technology. And what I've just done in a matter of seconds is build an executive team that needs to communicate better, become more efficient and more functional Mm -hmm. and start to be able to contribute to the organization as well as the customers that they service. You and I have been a, to you know connecting on and off for years, and one of the things that I've been doing, you know, even before you and I met, but all the way through, is being able to train people on that first type of communication, which is called thinking communication. So that's number one. So does this any of this make sense, or does this trigger any stories or any experiences inside you? that you would say, oh my gosh, that's, yeah, that I've had some experiences like this. So, so uh, what does this bring up for you? And what are you, what are you well, hearing? Uh, you know, I teach communication in the classroom, so we always know that. And so today's conversation was, was on language. And we were talking about how different people have different ways of processing information, making assumptions. And, and it went, you know, directly to that lecture of how we make the, you know, there's, there's a picture of a sweater. And to me, I swear it was green. And they're like, no, it's blue. It's blue. It's really, it's a, it's a royal blue. You got to, you know, and they had to come up all over here to go ahead and see what, what the color was. And I'm like, you know, describe it. And we were talking about the being concrete and being specific. And, you know, you've got people from all sorts of different walks of life and they, you know, I give them my favorite example. I've just given you the most expensive diamond in the whole world. And I want you to create that that jewelry of design that you would like to have made with with that. And it was interesting at who created what. There's a guy who struggles on the specificity of following directions and details. But when it came to making this diamond and what he wanted, it was absolutely unbelievable. The guy who can't put any words together was able to get something that, that worked. And the guy who's got diamonds up the yin yang over everything said, I want to have diamonds on each of my teeth here so when it opens it goes in a glare and they need to get glasses and it was it was fun to get these people out of their shells and so on and so forth and I also think of my experience working with um, the TED Talks because in the TED Talks you have these characters of these different people of the guy who's 
the chief guru who wants to go ahead and get this happen. You've got the operations guy who's like, you know, we need to get the lights and the sound and we can't do anything with the lights and the sound. And there's the other person, but we got to be fair on how we're choosing or selecting these people. And you can't do a TED all by yourself. You need a combination of all these people coming together to, to work with one another. And that's an example of uh, you know, how people can collaborate together and work together. Now, like I mentioned at the beginning, this is what I would call one third of the conflict. One third of the conflict is people are bringing different skill sets together. You have the person behind the camera at the TED talk, you have the speaker in front, you have the lighting person, we have the sound mm -hmm. person, mm -hmm. we have the person that's doing operations or organizing and scheduling and make sure a person is on and off the stage in a certain amount of time. All of those things make a collaborative whole brain experience. And this is essentially what whole brain communication or preference-based communication talks about is how can that collaborative team work together? And because that was one of the foundational questions that I started my professional career with mm -hmm. is that I kept training that for, and I've continued to train that I'm doing a training in Flint, Michigan in about two weeks. And I'm going to be training groups, uh, different size groups over the about a three day period while I'm there. And it's all about not only just knowing, okay, here's the preference communication, but what happens when a person's emotion comes into it? Cause it changes that that's where it changed things. And this is where the second style of communication shows up. Mm -hmm. Communication style number two, or the ty different type of communication, um, is called needs-based communication or mm -hmm. compassionate communication. Now, a lot of times people have some idea that they're a compassionate person or a kind person or a person that you know, cares about others, but do they have the language that actually matches those values? And so what I really do is I start by asking people a question is that, how do you know when there is empathy that takes place between one person and another person? How do you know and how can you measure if there's empathy between one person and another person. So I get to ask you the question and we get to have a little bit of fun with this. So what do you think and how do you know when empathy comes up, or even if you have an active definition of empathy, that would work in this moment too. So well, what empathy, is something that you have? Empathy as is when you put yourself in someone else's shoes. So a working example of that is there are some students in my class who call me on the phone and um, they have my phone number. It's a Google voice number. And I said, so how's your outline coming along? And he said, oh, it's come along. Okay. I said, well, what about your peers? And he says, well, you know, based on your last lecture that you gave to us in class, I would anticipate that people are not going to be turning in their assignments late because, you know, the, the point that you went ahead and made. And we get to class today and how many more people have their outlines? And they're getting upset that you've moved up the deadline. It doesn't matter when the deadline is. They're still going to come in at the same particular point in time. But it obviously it had registered with him. It had registered with him. And he had the empathy to go ahead and understand and say, no, I, I get it. I, I know exactly where you're coming from. Or um, So you've given me a couple of things to work off of right there. First one uh, to peel the first one off is put yourself into somebody else's shoes. And then the second one, you gave me a story about how somebody had to do a thing called stretch towards consideration. That's stretch course consideration about what somebody. Now, actually, both of those two things are in the category called a sympathetic moment versus an empathetic moment. And I'll show you the difference here really quickly. Um, because I do high conflict mediation, because I'm a person that goes into rooms full of people that scream at each other. And if I go in there with problem solving, I'm going to get my leg bitten off if I try that because problem solving is not empathy. Coming up with a mutual solution is not empathy. Putting yourself into somebody else's shoes is a cultural belief that I have 
everybody I talk to that gives me that example, I go, Hey, listen, can we turn the dial a little bit up a little bit? Because if you really think about putting yourself into somebody's shoes, then you've got your feet in somebody else's stinky uh, shoes. And that might not be the thing because I won't know or be able to sympathize or empathize with somebody that has lost a child because I really haven't had that experience of that experience. Oh, if I put myself in their shoes, it just means I'm like walking sort of in their shoes, but I'm not making an empathetic consideration. So Rosalyn and anybody that's listening to us right now, I ask people to adjust their definition to the following definition and watch what happens. If we look at a new definition or a new app application, uh, a way to apply empathy is, is that we start adopting the philosophy that empathy only occurs when a feeling word and a need word mm -hmm. are connected and agreed upon. So this one's tough. A feeling word and a need word are connected and then agreed upon. So this is where it gets a little unsettling because most of the time, Rosalyn, people don't have a very strong feeling vocabulary. Most of the time, people don't have a very strong need vocabulary. I'm going to say something, try not to laugh, but we really don't need a car. What we need is we have a need for transportation. Car is one way to meet that need. That's called a request or a result. But really, if I have my need for transportation met, as my son would say, I just take my electric uh, scooter. I don't need a car. And he's right. He's getting his need for transportation met. So what if it takes him a half an hour or 15 minutes longer than taking a car? So the main thing is, is that if we, as, as in step number two, is if we get a feeling word and get a need word, it turns into empathy for self might sound like, I feel tired. I'm pointing to my belly right now. I right. need rest and I'm making a request to go to sleep by 1030 tonight. Mm -hmm. That's called the feeling need request. And that is an empathetic moment. So one of the important things when we get take a look at preference communication, which is different than needs communication, those two things can collaborate with each other just so that there is enough vocabulary that takes place. Now, I know that we're really pressed for time on this call, so I'll include the third style of communication right now, and then we'll talk about whatever you like to, because sure. the third style of communication has to do with beliefs or biases communication where I'm advocating for a point of view that I am and have developed a certain form of stability and certainty around because that belief works for me in the world. And that's called a belief or a bias sentence. There's nothing wrong with beliefs and biases. They create a lot of stability for us as human beings. And they create a lot of foundation for us human beings to trust the world. Right. You know, and so these three components, the thinking component, the behavioral or needs component, and the belief component are really the three examples of communication that I teach and train in the outside world and help executives develop because they can apply to every uh, things that they're dealing with personally and professionally. Right. It can really make a big difference. Wow. 
Yeah. So, so as you, as you think about those, I mean, I can talk an hour about, you know, uh, an hour more about each one of those, or actually a day more about each one of those, just to, to just laugh a little bit, but it's like, if you don't, when we don't embody these three kinds of situation, we turn into things like monster people and nice dead people instead of compassionate people, which we're seeing outside in the world. We, we have people believing a, a somebody with that has a label and a diagnosis, which is a belief or a bias is like, Oh, those bad. And just fill in the person's name, that group of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it's, and it's volatility right there. And it really literally doesn't need to be there, but regrettably our language is what causes the conflict. Our language what is what escalates our emotions. Nobody is making us feel anything. It's our needs that are causing us to feel things. Right, and right, so, right. So those are the things that I try to contribute. And I I look to tra- do in my trainings and my individual coaching sessions to bring those things out into the world. Fantastic. Now, you also mentioned you had a book that was up and coming. I do. Thanks for mentioning that. And the title of the book is called The Emotional Sobriety Solution. And it is a solution about how to become less reactive, have more peace and joy in your world in 30 days. What does that mean? Well, as soon as somebody says something crappy to you, there's a way to convert it into something that's compassionate or something that's protective or something that's empathetic or something that's life serving for both you as well as the person that is really saying something pretty junky in our direction. And it's very, very helpful. And it's going to be out in the next two weeks. I'm really excited about it. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. So what have you been doing for fun? You sound like you're always working, 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 working. I want to know where the fun comes in. The fun has to do with things I do with my kids. Uh, with my youngest kid, I scuba dive and play guitar. So those are two things Great. that I have fun. With my middle kid, I go fishing with him and we go out and do adventures and go get lunch a lot. And then with my daughter, you know, we get together and talk about life and uh, professional challenges. So we have a lot of fun. So those are the three things I do most of the time. Oh, that is exciting. Well, it's been really great, you know, connecting with you and hearing all the wonderful things that you're doing in the world. It's it's absolutely amazing. Is there a particular type of company that you work or employees that you strive to work with or something like that? Oh, that's a great question. There are companies that I usually work with. I do I train their executive teams and then for the rest of the employees, I have an online uh training a program that the employees go on and see me on video and do online training uh, throughout the organization, whether it's 50 employees or a thousand employees, they, they get online and they're able to go through my course and I'm able to train them uh, at their own time throughout a year. 